Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Cancer Center Grand Rounds. Uh, real pleasure to introduce Dr. Ricardo Aguiar. Um, Ricardo um, did his uh, initial clinical training as well as his PhD at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil before uh, first going to London for a postdoc with, um, with the late John Goldman, one of the really seminal figures in the CMO field. He then went to Boston and did a second postdoc with Dr. Margaret Ship, one of the leading investigators in the lymphoma field at the, at the Farber, uh, before landing in around 2005 at the University of Texas in San Antonio, where he has been um, ever since. He's risen up through the ranks there to his current, uh, current position as a, as a full professor with tenure. Ricardo is, um, is, has had quite a remarkable career in the lymphoma field, and particularly at that, at that tr um, interface between basic and, uh, and laboratory work. Having that background himself, he's personally brought forward um, uh, at two ongoing clinical trials that focus on unique metabolic properties of lymphoma cells. And so he's had the opportunity to take that from the laboratory to the clinic and is now studying those patients. He's also performed a variety of different types of analyses of lymphoma uh, from the context of unique uh, microRNAs that affect the biology of lymphoma cells, some of the gene expression patterns that define um, the most aggressive forms of lymphoma. He was actually involved with uh, the original studies from Todd Golub's group that um, helped us um, develop a molecular fingerprint for what aggressive lymphomas uh, look like from a gene expression um, perspective and so forth. And he's also got kind of a side hobby working on adrenal gland tumors uh, for a couple of projects as well. But all these, all these um, efforts have been sort of well documented in a series of really lovely papers that he's been publishing over the past 10 to 20 years. Uh, these efforts, of course, have, have uh, resulted in a number of nice awards as well as funding from, from all the major agencies. So Ricardo, it's a real pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you, uh, Greg, very much, and uh, actually, again, nice uh, to meet you uh, the first time. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, met a lot of interesting folks this morning, and I hope to carry on through the afternoon. So um, uh, we are interested in, in translational research, and I, uh, my take uh, from been doing this for 20 years is that really you have to play the long game. I think what I try to convey with this uh, statement is that I think most of the progress is made in the lab. I think longer you stay in the lab before you go to the clinic, more likely is that you're going to be successful. I think also that this notion that it costs $1 billion to take a drug to the market, uh, to the clinic successfully, is in part because we don't really pay attention to this principle and we go perhaps too quickly to the clinic. And to illustrate how we, we, we take this very seriously, I'm going to present uh, two projects in my lab that um, have the same uh, uh, purpose. We are interested in understanding the tumor cell at the very deep level and then translate that into a clinical initiative that is uh, new and rationally developed. Uh, these two projects are in very different phases of uh, development, and one uh, explores, uh, tries to identify metabolic vulnerabilities in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and we are really in the lab right now, so it feels like that, as if you're making no progress at all. Most of the time, you think that you are going backwards, but eventually it happens. The other, and I will spend most of my time here, is about 45, 40 minutes, and then I will compress uh, another project that we have taken all the way to the clinic. This is how to restore cyclic MP signals uh, in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and because I'm compressing 15 years in about 10 minutes, it will feel really like that. But the notion is that they are both the same, so we, we understand the disease and we take to the clinic. So um, having said that, I need to introduce to you the disease that we are most interested in is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, it's actually the most common hematological cancer and the most common lymphoid cancer in adults. There are about 30,000 new cases in the U.S. alone every year. Uh, and what is important is that 40% of the patients still fail for uh, first-line treatment. And first line is for uh, the LBCL or CHOP. CHOP itself is about 25 years old, or 30, and the introduction of rituximab is about 15 years old and has, it, has improved the survival rate by about 10%, 10 to 15. But we still, uh, m many patients will, will die of their disease. And I think what the field has done in the past uh, 15, 20 years is really to understand very well the genetic heterogeneity uh, of this disorder. Uh, the LBCL is really an umbrella uh, term 
uh, it encompasses several diseases that are really different. And although we can very well recognize them so far, we still cannot treat uh, these, uh, these tumors differently. And I think the main, uh, the, the, the close we are to translating from the genetic heterogeneity to the clinic is emphasis on inhibiting the B cell receptor, and many labs are interested in that, and also uh, modulating epigenetic uh, modifiers, uh, in particular EZH2, and also, which I think is really the holy grail of our lymphoma, trying to target a MYC. Uh, contrary to many other tumors, uh, I think there is, have, we have had less emphasis on metabolomics changes in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and, and for that reason, my lab became interested in it. So I think I don't need to tell many of you here that have been really pioneering a lot of the work uh, uh, that metabolic reprogramming is really a, a feature of all cancers. But I think the, the field has had a notion, and it's still very present, that this is really an adaptation, is a secondary event to... Uh, that is critically necessary, but still secondary to the activity of oncogenes and the lack of activity of tumor suppressor genes. And eventually you rewire the metabolism because you need to produce enough uh, biomass to sustain the growth of cancer cells. But I think a little bit of change on this concept came from the identification, the notion that mitochondrial enzymes themselves, are part of the TCA cycle, can be muted in cancer and can cause cancer. So I think this uh, is, a, is a discrepancy to the notion of that I just introduced before that uh, metabolic reprogram is secondary. So here you have metabolic enzymes that are mutant in cancers and can cause cancers. I highlighted four of them. And I, uh, there is IDH1 that is well known to many of you. Uh, SDH, which is the complex two of the mitochondria, SDH, uh, A, B, C, and D have been found to be mutant in different cancers. And fumarate hydratase. Uh, what these uh, different mitochondria enzymes have in common, however, although they are present in different tumor types, mostly here sporad uh, hereditary and rare tumor types, and here also in sporadic tumor types, uh, IDH, they have a common pathogenesis. Uh, it seems to be the case that in, in, when you lose uh, these enzymes, FH and SDH, or when you gain a function of IDH mutations, you accumulate metabolites that have one feature in common. They are all structurally related to alpha ketoglutarate. And because of that, they, they can competitively inhibit a class of enzymes called alpha-KG-dependent dioxygenases. And this is a very large family of about 80 enzymes. And I'm highlighting here three of them, the prolyl hydroxylases for HIF and collagen, uh, the TET DNA hydroxylases and the histone dimethylases because they have been the most studied uh, since uh, IDH mutants have been identified. But because, again, IDH uh, is the most common, is present in sporadic cancers, and is also present in AML, I'm going to focus on it for, from here on. So this is a very interesting model for uh, mutation in cancer. Uh, I'm going to, uh, on the left side, I'm describing to you uh, what is the way that uh, normal IDH1 and 2 function. Uh, these enzymes, they oxidate isocytrate in alpha-KG, and this is a uh, reversible uh, modification or activity. Uh, so IDH2 can also reduce uh, alpha ketoglutarate back to isocytrate. What is different when IDH1 or 2 is mutant is that the oxidation is preserved. So actually patients with IDH mutant uh, do not have different levels of alpha ketoglutarate. However, the enzyme does not reduce alpha KG back to isocytrate. Instead, it generates a metabolite called D2 hydroxylutarate. And when this was described, very little, uh, very few people knew at all about D2 hydroxylutarate. It turns out uh, that this is a natural metabolite we all have, and this is present throughout evolution from plants to, to humans. And actually, it comes in two forms. There are, there's a, an, an antimer to D2 hydroxylutarate called L2 hydroxylutarate. And uh, nature has actually created two enzymes sitting different chromosomes, are all different, that are capable of oxidating 2 hydroxylutarate, be it D or L, into alpha ketoglutarate. Uh, it's of note that this uh, reaction is also reversible, so these enzymes can reduce alpha KG back to these metabolites. Now, although we don't know. Uh, really how these metabolites are created. They seem to be bioproducts of other reactions in the mitochondria, or what are their normal function, if any. We know that they are not inert, because if you do not have the enzymes D2 or L2 hydroxylate dehydrogenase, you have a very rare but very serious disease and, and fatal. It's a neurometabolic syndrome from kids that are born from consanguineous parents that have uh, mutations in one allele and then is a compound heterozygous and, and the disease emerges. So we know that it's critically important to have these enzymes uh, and that these metabolites are not inert. Now, when uh, 
IDH mutations were described in, uh, in AML. My lab became interested in seeing whether this uh, metabolic deregulation of alpha ketoglutarate rate levels was also present in lymphoma. Uh, and instead of looking only at the IDH and knowing that these enzymes exist, we decided to resequence about 150 diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but not only IDH1 and 2, but IDH1, 2, D2 hydroxylate rate, and L2 hydroxylate rate, because all of these enzymes control to some extent the levels of alpha ketoglutarate rate in a cell. And uh, we confirmed what other, others had seen, which is a lack uh, of mutations of IDH1 and 2 in lymphoid cancers, but we found that 5% of the diffuse large B cell lymphomas have a uh, loss of function mutation, often heterozygous, uh, in D2 hydroxylate dehydrogenase. L2 hydroxylate dehydrogenase is not mutant in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And we were able to demonstrate that these mutations uh, lead to a, a massive epigenetic deregulation. At that time, when we reported this, we uh, we're only looking at, uh, we actually look at prolyhydroxylase and HIF stability, but also DNA and histone hypermethylation. So what we showed at that time was that tumors, uh, primary tumors or genetic models that we created that uh, lost one allele of this enzyme wouldn't have a massive epigenetic deregulation. Uh, but this work uh, uh, led to us to ask two questions. And I think, uh, so from here on, most of the data that we'll present is unpublished. Um, uh, we did not look at the effects of loss of that enzyme and accumulation of D2 hydroxylate rate in DLBCL growth in that paper that I showed you. We looked only at epigenetic mod modifications, but we decided to look at uh, what are the effects in DLBCL growth and survival. And if we map this well, can we therefore identify strategies to really exploit this potential metabolic imbalance in DLBCL and then treat the patients better? Right. So. To start, we created uh, the simplest model. We took uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma cell lines that do not express uh, D2 hydroxylate dehydrogenase. We overexpressed the enzyme. We detected the uh, expected change, metabolically speaking. D2 hydroxylate levels dropped and alpha ketoglutarate uh, became elevated. And then the cells that had now overexpression of D2 grew, uh, had a decreased uh, fitness. So they, they grew uh, less efficiently. Suggestion that. Uh, loss of this gene may be really uh, have a tumor suppressive uh, profile. But this was a gain of function model. We were proposing a tumor suppressive model. So we actually created took, uh, three different diffuse large B cell lymphoma cell lines and create CRISPR based knockouts of D2 hydroxylate And lo and behold, we found that the cells when losing D2 hydroxylate dehydrogenase uh, uh, have increased fitness, they grow uh, more efficiently, and this is always accompanied by a accumulation of D2 hydroxylate rate. Uh, I can advance to you that this uh, enhanced fitness is associated with both an anti apoptotic profile and accumulation of cells in S phase. So we were mapping uh, nicely that if you gain the enzyme, the cells grow less efficiently. If you knock out, the cells uh, tend to grow. It seems really to be a tumor suppressive gene model, but because this is the age of CRISPR and reviewers that never try to edit a genome, always ask you to edit the genome. Uh, we, we took a diffuse large B cell lymphoma cell line that has a heterozygous mutation uh, in D2 hydroxylate here, uh, and we corrected it after, God, how long? Uh, and then we first confirmed that these uh, subtle change is one, uh, is a heterozygous mutation, as you can see, uh, really uh, very specifically decrease the D2 hydroxylate level shown here. This is the, is an isogenic model otherwise. It's a mutant uh, cell line and the same cell line with that single correction. And uh, specific because you don't change the levels of L2 hydroxylate and we, uh, as expected, given the activity of the enzyme, increase alpha ketoglutarate levels. But what was remarkable is that this cell with the single change and accompanying metabolic uh, modifications, uh, now it becomes, uh, it grows less efficiently. So uh, everything was sort of uh, really coming to terms. Uh, so we had a evidence uh, from several models now that D2 hydroxylate dehydrogenase functions as a tumor suppressor gene in the LBCL and that the accumulation of D2 hydroxylutarate, the metabolite, may promote cell growth. And then a paper was published in Cell showing that actually the opposite is true, that D2 hydroxylutarate actually has anti-tumor uh, activity. Uh, and uh, 
notably, uh, this uh, paper built on AML models and in the IEH1 and 2 uh, mutant uh, uh, cells, uh, which, although accumulating D2-hydroxyglutarate, may be different from what we are seeing when we knock out or edit uh, the enzyme D2 hydroxyltrate dehydrogenase. So we really went back to the drawing board, to the biochemical understanding of these two enzymes. And two, two features are important. One is that mutant IDH1 and 2 have an incredibly high kinetic activity. So the accumulation of uh, D2 hydroxyltrate uh, in these cells in the millimolar amounts. So we knew that the amounts here were likely to be higher than here, but we we have not tested it yet. And contrary to these expected very high levels, uh, D2 hydroxyltrate is a metabolite that is detected at very, very low levels. So even when you remove the enzyme completely, the accumulation is unlikely to be to that extent. So to test this hypothesis that probably or possibly one of the explanations between our data and the published data would be the levels we create isogenic models wherein we either overexpress one of the IDH2 mutant uh, cells, uh, sorry, mutants uh, in a cell line, or knock out d 2 hydroxyglutarate and then went on to quantify the levels of d 2 hydroxyglutarate And again, uh, in, in confirming this uh, notion that had been already established uh, that this enzyme has very high activity, we found about a five-fold higher level of D2 hydroxyltrate in the same cell when you overexpress an IDH2 mutant versus when you knock out D2. And I have to say that this is the R140 mutant. If you do 172 mutant, the level is uh, tenfold higher. So uh, it's a known fact that the 172 uh, mutant uh, AMLs have uh, and other tumors have higher levels of D2 hydroxyltrate. One of the advancements in the, in the field here was the synthesis and availability of uh, uh, conjugated uh, D2 hydroxyltrate that is uh, cell permeable. It's, oct it's called octil D2 hydroxyltrate. And we were able to get our hands on that and then show that we can uh, mimic uh, the either loss of D2 hydroxyltrate dehydrogenase or mutant IDH2 by using synthetic metabolite that is cell permeable. So 20 micromolar, if you expose the cell to 20 micromolar, eventually you get what is equivalent to the loss of the gene, whereas you have to go to 300 micromolar to mimic the IDH mutant status. And I have to say that that paper in cell that I showed you uh, consistently used 300 micromolar throughout the paper, right? For a reason, because IDH mutant uh, makes that much. So we thought that maybe the lab is everything that matters. So we went back to a, a really an extended panel of diffuse large B cell lymphoma cell lines here, and we have data from about 20 of them. It's always the same. Incredibly, to us at least in the beginning, if you expose these cells to 20 micromolar uh, of D2 hydroxyltrate, which is the same as knocking out D2, the cells consistently uh, have enhanced fitness. They grow more. Conversely, if you add the 300 micromolar that is equivalent to the IDH mutant status uh, as far as metabolite quantity is concerned, the cells die. Uh, they cannot support that uh, amount. So it actually reconciles our data with the AML data. And to me, actually, it explains why diffuse large B cell lymphomas or B cell malignancies in general do not have IDH mutations. It, it will be counter uh, Productive. Uh, the cells, maybe they even get by chance, but they, they do not survive. So we, we concluded that there is a, the D2 hydroxyglutarate levels are commensurate with the genetic uh, defect, and that in, when you lose D2 hydroxyglutarate, it's growth promoting, associated therefore with diffuse large B cell lymphomas that lack this enzyme. And uh, if you have uh, IDH levels, some AMLs would survive, uh, and, but not diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So, uh, what I have shown you so far is that uh, if you accumulate the right amount of D2 hydroxyglutarate in this disease, you have a, uh, uh, a non-com metabolite profile and the cells become more, uh, have increased fitness. Uh, to us, it was always puzzling that this was always, in our case, accompanied by a decrease in alpha ketoglutarate. So we posed a very simple question. If this is a non com metabolite, as many people like to call, is this a tumor suppressive metabolite? So we decided to test this idea. Uh, so we started by a large panel of diffuse large B cell lymphoma cell lines that represent really the uh, heterogeneity of the disease. We have the, the, the GCB type or BCR dependent. We have the OXFOS types. We have the ABC types. And in all instances, uh, in a dose and uh, time dependent manner, alpha ketoglutarate that is cell permeable uh, suppress the growth of these cells. This data was so uh, sort of over compelling that in the beginning I thought that, well, this is probably just a, a general 
uh, poison to, to B cells, uh, and it will kill any cell that you see. I have to say that before we went there, we showed that this is always through a massive increase in apoptosis. And then to test this notion that this could be really, uh, really a general poison, we collected normal B cells, these are murine B cells, and exposed them to the same amount that we are exposing here, a panel of 14 diffuse large B cell lymphoma cell lines, all which are to some extent suppressed in growth, and the normal B cells grew completely unencumbered by uh, alpha ketoglutarate, so they really didn't care. So this is not just a general killing machine, so I think there's a dependence of diffuse large B cell lymphomas on alpha ketoglutarate levels. To explore these, with this data we became more interested and then we explored it in vivo. So we created two xenograph models of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. In both instances, the tumors either developed very poorly or failed to develop when the mice were treated with alpha ketoglutarate uh, given IP. Uh, this was not devoid of toxicity and we did a, a, a small MTD study uh, where mice were exposed, well there's a xenograph model and they exposed a different dosing uh, of uh, alpha ketoglutarate and we encountered two, uh, two uh, models of administration, either daily at 100 milligrams per kg or once a week that were really tumor suppressive. And in this study, these mice here had no toxicity. And by that, I mean CBCs were normal, uh, uh, liver enzymes were normal. There was no uh, weight loss. So we, we, we find that there is, at least in animal models, uh, small animal models, a, uh, an avenue to develop this further. So we had cell lines in vitro and in vivo. Uh, normal B cells didn't, didn't change. So what about primary samples? So uh, because it's so much easier to obtain CLL and is a material B cell malignancy after all, uh, we had a panel of diffuse large B cell lymphoma cell lines, I'm sorry, primary tumors. These are viable cells, a follicular lymphoma and CLL. And what was clear in all instances is that when you ex vivo expose these cells to alpha ketoglutarate, there is a, a significant increase in apoptosis. Uh, I include here one normal germinal center B cell. The, the, the data that I showed to you before on normal B cells are murine B cells. So this is human tonsil uh, and uh, germinal center, well-characterized B cells, and these cells were also significantly less sensitive to alpha ketoglutarate uh, than the cancer cells. So this is not a fancy uh, distinction between mice and men. Uh, human B cells also are not sensitive to alpha ketoglutarate unless they are uh, apparently uh, malignant. Uh, so this is all nice, but how this is happening? We know all that alpha ketoglutarate has a, a variety of, of activities. Uh, how is it that uh, exposing uh, malignant B cells to alpha ketoglutarate results in growth suppression? Uh, we actually borrowed from a non-cancer literature. There was a paper about the time we were involved with this uh, in C. elegans in uh, Nature showing that alpha ketoglutarate actually expands the lifespan of worms, and it does so by suppressing mTOR. So uh, my rationale at that time, our rationale was that uh, in, in normal cells, it's kind of non-malignant cells, uh, it's, it makes sense to turn TOR off uh, to save energy and the cells quiesce and they don't die, but they are there and they are saving energy. Cancer cells, however, some of them depend uh, develop a over-reliance in mTOR, and perhaps if you just turn uh, mTOR off a little bit, the cells would collapse. And we decided to test this idea by first looking at our panel of cells, cell lines or primary samples that are highly sensitive to alpha ketoglutarate to what happens to TOR activity when they are exposed to alpha ketoglutarate. And again, uh, we use two uh, markers here of uh, well-established markers of TOR activity, phosphorylation of P70 or for ABP. And in all instances, we see a marked decrease in TOR activity. Uh, and uh, validating this notion that normal cells uh, also get TOR to be inhibited, but are less sensitive. sensitive. Here is that uh, normal GCB that I showed you that doesn't go into apoptosis when you expose to alpha ketoglutarate, or doesn't go much into apoptosis, and it's as suppressed uh, as far as TOR is concerned as the cancer cells. So I think the cancer cells here have an over-reliance on TOR and are very sensitive to its inhibition and collapse. I have to make the point that this is an exposure to only eight hours of alpha ketoglutarate. This is not like after three days, all cells die in culture. So the cells are as good as they started, uh, but TOR is turned off earlier, and then you can measure the cell inhibition growth wise uh, a little bit later. Uh, that is fine, but how is it that alpha ketoglutarate connects to suppression of TOR? 
the paper on C. elegans had already briefly uh, touched on this. Uh, it turns out that alpha ketoglutarate can bind to complex 5 in the mitochondria. Uh, this is the ATP synthase, and then uh, inhibits it. Uh, and we decided to test if this was happening in, in our model. We started by, can we measure complex 5 activity in my lab? And it turns out that we could. Uh, and uh, oligomycin is a classical complex 5 inhibitor, and uh, we show here in a classical uh, substrate, uh, bovine heart mitochondria, and we just were able to show that uh, alpha ketoglutarate in a dose-dependent manner also inhibits complex 5 activity. We expanded on these initial data on uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma cell lines, and we showed that uh, oligomycin here is in orange, which is the sort of a positive control. We showed that there is a very uh, consistent decrease in activity of complex 5 uh, in diffuse large B-cell lymphomas that are exposed to alpha ketoglutarate sometimes in a dose-dependent manner, other times not so, uh, but uh, consistent. And you can more simply measure complex 5 activity by quantifying only ATP. So we took uh, that larger panel of cell lines that we have shown from the beginning and showed that uh, if you expose the cells to alpha ketoglutarate, there is a massive uh, decrease. There is a substantial decrease, not massive, but substantial decrease in the ATP levels, which we think is uh, secondary to the inhibition of complex 5 activity. Now, how to connect... Uh, this drop in complex 5 activity ATP levels to TOR. We, I think the, the obvious candidate is really AMPK. AMPK is a central sensor, a fuel uh, sensor really uh, in the cell and, t in, and, and tends to be uh, activated by uh, decreasing ATP levels. And in, in doing so, uh, what it, one of the things, of many things that it does is to suppress TOR. So we think that the connection is here, and we have preliminary exploited that. So these are two different models of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. We <clears throat> expose them to alpha-KG, and there is an increase in AMPK activity uh, measured here by phosphorylation at uh, theronine-172. And actually, we decided to check if this increase here was sufficient to increase the activity of the enzyme itself, and then we tested the phosphorylation of one of the targets of AMPK for uh, ACC, and there's a massive increase in, in fossil ACC upon exposure to alpha-KG. But this actually to us brought, uh, brought back another notion. Uh, this is uh, a inhibitory phosphorylation. So another way that alpha ketoglutarate may be suppressing the growth of these cells is by suppressing uh, fatty acid uh, synthesis. So uh, we, we use this as a marker, but I think eventually uh, it, it may become way more important than, than just a marker. Uh, this is all interesting, but can you give uh, alpha ketoglutarate to people? Uh, it turns out for those bodybuilders in the, in the room, uh, that actually alpha ketoglutarate is given as a non-FDA regulated supplement, and not only as a supplement uh, that you can buy at Walmart or whatever, uh, it, it actually, uh, there have been clinical trials, mostly in the setting of wound healing, patients that underwent uh, surgery, uh, not well controlled, but published nonetheless. Uh, so you can give uh, alpha ketoglutarate uh, to people, and actually the, the amount of alpha ketoglutarate ketoglutarate that has been given to humans in these trials is very commensurate to what we used in mice. So uh, the levels of co are comparable. Uh, in addition to that, uh, another group uh, did a very interesting work. They were able to actually nanosize uh, alpha ketoglutarate and put in nanoparticles and deliver uh, uh, in the lung uh, for cyanide poisoning. Uh, so the alpha ketoglutarate has been rovering around uh, human applications. So it's not something far-fetched that you can never even get close. We, we are trying to design something a little bit more, a little smarter perhaps. I don't know if it's going to be feasible. It looks like uh, we want to deliver this uh, specifically to B-cell lymphoma. So we are partnering with people in pharmacology. We are creating, uh, uh, we are basically nanosizing alpha-KG and putting inside liposomes. And we want to decorate these liposomes uh, with uh, rituximab uh, so that it will target specifically CD20 positive uh, cells. Uh, there's a trademark already here, ketosome. So we are patenting this thing before it's even, uh, so we have actually the alpha-KG inside the liposomes. We have yet uh, to pegulate and put a rituximab. But I think we, we are thinking that this may be a clever way and less, perhaps less toxic and really uh, a more concrete way to translate these findings uh, to the clinic. Now, I don't want to leave you with the notion that the only way that alpha ketoglutarate suppresses growth of the LBCL is through mTOR at all. Uh, and, and this brings the idea of these alpha ketoglutarate dependent oxygenases that I mentioned in the beginning. 
So this is a very large class of enzymes, there are about 80 of them. And uh, we have only scratched the surface in the cancer field by looking at histone dimethylase, TET DNA hydroxylase, prolyl hydroxylases. Uh, but they, 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 they are way large and important. And they consistently use uh, iron and ascorbate, vitamin C, as cofactors and alpha-KG as a cosubstrate. Work in my lab, we have really found that these are all except for iron that we have in test, these are rate limiting to these enzymes activity, meaning that if I have more uh, vitamin C and more alpha-KG, the enzymes are increasing activity to a plateau, but they increase consistently. And again, uh, these are the ones that have been the most studied, but uh, uh, my group has uh, last year uh, actually shown for the first time that uh, actually RNA dimethylases, uh, FTO and ALKBH5, are also alpha ketoglutarate rate dependent dioxygenases. To be fair, we didn't discover that they are alpha KG dependent dioxygenases. We were the first to show that in IDH mutant AMLs, uh, these enzymes are also uh, inhibited by D2 hydroxyl accumulation, and therefore, it's not just hypermethylation of DNA and histone, but also an RNA. Uh, I don't know how much you know about RNA methylation, but it's really the next frontier, which is kind of cute here in Denver. But uh, so they, it's a, uh, it's really there's a, a massive Massive change in the transcriptome uh, as far as RNA methylation is concerned, uh, and uh, RNA methyltransferases and RNA demethylase. And if you follow the literature, you see that this is becoming very, uh, very present in, in, in cancer. So, uh, we more importantly, uh, it has already been shown in cancer, is particularly in AML, that uh, you can modulate uh, the activity of uh, TET in particular. Uh, because that's the one that's mutant in AML, and it's often a heterozygous mutation, you can modulate that activity by adding more vitamin C. Uh, so vitamin C works as a cofactor, and if you increase the amount of vitamin C, I think mouse models from Sean Morrison's lab and Yannis Eafantis uh, showed very clearly that this is possible, and I think it's a, actually a re-emergency of the notion of vitamin C as a, as a cancer drug that was proposed back in the 70s, but it failed uh, because I think the trials were not done properly. So here we are. One billion dollars after uh, uh, really investing on the genome and, and understanding the cell, and I'm proposing that we're going to cure cancer at least in part by giving a, a supplement of a ketoglutarate and vitamin C. But uh, I think that even if these remedies fail, you can always run to higher office and 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 and, and, and well, unfortunately, not only run but uh, win. Uh, so, uh, so I think I think there is hope to almost everyone. Uh, so, uh, to summarize this first part, uh, I think we, in, in, in our view, D2 hydroxyl rate is really a, uh, a new mitochondrial enzyme that can be uh, is mutated in cancer and, and, and associated with a cancer phenotype. Uh, if you accumulate D2 hydroxyl rate at the right amount, uh, that is commensurate with loss of this enzyme, it promotes the physiological cell lymphoma cell growth. Uh, we, we are very convinced that alpha ketoglutarate has tumor suppressive properties in diffuse large B cell lymphomas and probably in many mature B cell malignancies. Uh, we have shown that it uses, uh, inhibits complex 5, drops ATP levels, activates MPK, and suppresses store. But we think really that this is just one of the avenues. Uh, I think the dioxygenases are out there to be uh, shown to play a role as well. And uh, our intention really to deliver alpha-KG with therapeutic intent. And hopefully this uh, idea of putting li liposomes and, and decorating with uh, rituximab is going to work. Uh, we, we are hopeful uh, of that. Um, now, so now I'm back to that. Uh, so we have somewhat the blueprint on how to go really from the bench from the very beginning to the clinic. And this is how we did it before. Uh, I have plenty of time. So, uh, uh, and, and this is a completely different story. It's uh, the attempt to restore cyclic MP levels uh, inside uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma uh, tumor or cell. And uh, uh, I have to go back and give you some more biochemistry here. I'm really sorry about that. But, uh, so cyclic MP is the classical second messenger. So this is a uh, molecule that uh, has been figured out uh, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, it, it, it serves a purpose. It, it, it transduces the signals from hormones that are uh, uh, not capable of entering the, the cell membrane. So a, a classical hormone binds to a receptor, often a G-protein coupled receptor. In the, the case of cyclic MP, it, uh, a G-protein binds to adenyl cyclases and generate AMP, I'm sorry, cyclic MP from ATP. And the signal is mostly transduced, no matter the, the intent of the, the hormone here, the signal eventually is transduced primarily uh, through uh, 
PKA. Uh, but there are other mediators of cyclic MP signaling as well. What is important in the context of this presentation is that cyclic MP has been long recognized from the 70s, really, uh, to be a suppressive molecule to both innate and adaptive immune cells. Uh, and because cyclic MP signaling can be so broad, uh, there is a, a very well a robust uh, evolutionarily conserved class of enzymes that serve only the purpose of uh, hydrolyzing cyclic MP back to AMP, which is inert. And uh, there are 11 families, PD1 through 11. Uh, within each family, there are several genes, and there are, within several genes, there are many isoforms that are tissue-specific and cell-specific. Uh, and sub-compartment specific in the cell. In short, there are about 150 phosphodiesterases. But uh, in immune cells, the dominant phosphodiesterase is PD-4. Uh, so again, PD-4 uh, hydrolyzed cyclic MP, which is inhibitory generating AMP. Now, how did we get to this story? Uh, how did this uh, cyclic MP and phosphodiesterase came to lymphoma? This is actually a paper that uh, Craig referred to uh, during the introduction. Uh, so this is what was the very first attempt to uh, use gene expression profiling. This is the very beginning of gene expression profiling. So we were interested in defining the signature, the smallest gene signature that can very robustly differentiate good outcome from bad outcome, the LBCLs. And this is what we came out, is a, a 17 gene signature. And to me, and this is where when I was at the far, but what uh, caught my attention was PD4B. So PD4B was one of the most highly expressed, differentially high expressed genes uh, in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So overexpressing fatal DLBCL, uh, low levels in, 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 in patients that survived their disease. Uh, I was attracted for many reasons to PD4, but uh, we first made sure that this was really a good marker for survival. So we had a, here we had about 80 patients. So we had a series of about 150, pa I'm sorry, about 300 pa patients with good uh, long-term outcome. And we showed that phosphodiesterase 4B expression could really dichotomize these tumors in, in good and, 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 and bad outcome. What is interesting is it took us, uh, we never knew Actually, we never pursued very, very, very hard uh, why the levels are high, but recently uh, in my lab we were uh, defining the super enhancers uh, in diffuse large B cell lymphoma and found to our delight and surprise that actually PD4B is one of the most uh, active in super enhancers in diffuse large B cell lymphomas. If you look at this list here, these are the usual suspects in the LBCL biology, BCL6, MIC, RF8, uh, PEX5, and PD4B sometimes has higher activity than, uh, uh, than these other oncogenes. So we know now that uh, it's because there is an uh, overactive enhancer, a super enhancer, right at the PD4B locus, and that's why this patient, these are two ABC patients, that's why they express high levels. But uh, to, to try to translate this, I need to explain uh, the, the principle. So we, I showed you that cyclic MP is growth inhibitory to uh, normal B cells and also malignant B cells, and that PD4 is the enzyme that hydrolyzes and terminates cyclic MP signaling. So the idea is kind of simple. You have to inhibit PD4 uh, because if you inhibit PD4, you accumulate cyclic MP, and this restores this uh, break in B cell growth uh, that is, uh, should be curtailed because the cell is a cancer cell. And uh, eventually it was to our uh, uh, benefit that the FDA actually approved uh, PD4 inhibitors for uh, patients with COPD uh, and also uh, psoriasis uh, in the past four or five years. So we have been able to go a little faster to the clinic by using off-label uh, indication in clinical trials. But so that's the principle. Cyclic MP is high, it's bad for the cell. PD4B is high, it's good for the cell. We inhibit PD4B, we may decrease uh, growth uh, of diffuse large B cell lymphoma in patients. So. This is really a compression of several years of work. Before we had access to the drug, really, we, we could do nothing but map really very well how is it that cyclic MP kills a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. We know it well now. It suppresses most of the uh, tyrosine kinase that are downstream to the B cell receptor. So immediately clear that the patients that will benefit the most, uh, the LBCL, wise are those that depend on this cell receptor signaling for survival. Uh, and uh, I highlighted this in red because that's the, that was really the first preclinical idea for a clinical trial. We found that cyclic MP levels, increasing it with PD4 inhibition preclinically, restore glucocorticoid sensitivity. And it did so through inhibition of AKT. This was actually uh, a, a coordinated with a paper published uh, showing that um, 
a more genome-wide paper in ALL showing that uh, AKT is a major gatekeeper in glucocorticoid sensitivity. And this is important because glucocorticoid sensitivity, glucocorticoid is still a cornerstone in the treatment of many uh, lymphoid cancers. So our, the, our first intent was to really show that you can give, uh, the drug is called Roflumilast. Uh, this is the PD-4 inhibitor that is FDA approved. You can give it to cancer patients safely. So we had to open a phase one, uh, one B trial, uh, and the patients were all relapsed refractory material B cell cancer, so a very uh, sort of bad population for anything, so we, it was safety. Uh, and we got two uh, additional benefits from showing that the drug is safe. So it's a pilot study, just 10 patients, but the first thing we showed is that if you give roflumilast, the PDE4 inhibitor alone to patients, uh, you have a, a significant decrease in PI3K activity. This is in agreement with our preclinical data. We showed that PI3K uh, is one of the first inhibited uh, class of enzymes downstream to the B cell receptor by cyclic MP. And actually, uh, these patients that was a very, again, a bad population, uh, some with uh, nine uh, previous treatments, uh, our intent here was one cycle and you were out. And actually, uh, there was uh, six of the nine patients that we could evaluate had some sort of either stable disease or partial response. This is highly unexpected. Look, this is only phosphodiesterase for inhibitor together with glucocorticoid. So the way the trial was set is we primed the patients. The, the patients took roflomilase throughout the trial. There were cycles of 21 days, but we always primed the patient with roflomilase first to get the glucocorticoid because our preclinical data suggests that you have to inhibit PD-4 for AKT to be suppressed, for glucocorticoid receptor to be, again, uh, active and then inhibition of uh, cell growth. So that's what we actually we found in the clinic. Uh, it was very in, in, in agreement with our uh, preclinical data. So we eventually reported this, uh, and we're excited about the possibility of using uh, what we really want, PD-4, in a, be in a better suited uh, set of patients. So, uh, but this work also sort of opened new uh, opportunities uh, because it's clear that as phosphodiesterase for inhibition, uh, really modulates the tyrosine kinase downstream to B cell receptor. Uh, they are really excellent candidates for combinations. Uh, and one of the combinations that I'm more excited about, and we published recently, uh, preclinically, is uh, with PI3K inhibitors. And I say that because we now know, we have very specifically shown that actually cyclic MP inhibits inhibits P85. This is the regulatory subunit of PI3K, not the catalytic. So when we combined with IDALA uh, in preclinical study, we saw a, a massive synergy. And it's expected to some extent because one is acting on P85, the other one is acting on P110. I think this drug is going to fall through because of toxicity, but all the phosphodiesterase, I'm sorry, PI3K inhibitors are still at play. Uh, and I think that it will be very, it makes, uh, sense uh, from a biological standpoint to combine these, these, these drugs. Uh, so uh, we, we think that has a, a major role to play uh, in uh, B-cell receptor dependent diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. Uh, so this is all about the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma cell line or the cancer cell line, but there was also data, again, non-cancer literature suggesting that phosphodiesterase 4 and cyclic MP can actually suppress vascular remodeling in non-neoplastic models. And we became interested with that because one of the less appreciated features of diffuse large B cell lymphomas is that um, actually angiogenesis play a massive role in this disease. So for the longest time, it has been known that patients with highest levels of VEGF or with higher microvessel density in the biopsy, they do poorly. Uh, and this is, uh, this data is actually not very old. It's from the, you know, about 10 years ago. And the data was so compelling that a clinic, a phase three trial was open, uh, combining RCHOP with Avastin. Uh, and this is because we know that angiogenesis play a role. However, the trial was negative, And I think it was negative because Avastin, as a significant inhibitor of, uh, of angiogenesis actually in combination of doxorubicin is not a good idea. So there was a, ma there was a, a significant increase in um, uh, cardiovascular toxicity and the trial actually was stopped. Uh, but it, it, I think the notion remains that angiogenesis play a role in diffuse large B cell lymphoma biology and we should try to find alternative ways of inhibiting it. And we thought why not take a look at PD-4 inhibition because uh, it has been shown to suppress vascular remodeling in non-neoplastic models. Now, you cannot study uh, angiogenesis in vitro. It's really just a waste of energy. So we made a, mod, a mouse model. So this is a MIC, 
uh, driven diffuse large B-cell lymphoma that now develops in the context of PD4 uh, intact or PD4B knockout uh, genes. And we basically created the mouse, waited for lymphoma to develop. The penetrance really here is very high, it's 100%. Uh, they develop lymphoma early, about 16 weeks on average. So it's a great model to study somewhat quickly. So we waited for the lymphoma to develop, collect the lymphoma, and, 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 and measure the amount of vessels. We found that uh, if the lymphoma develops uh, in a background of uh, absence of PD4B, there's a significant decrease in vessel formation. Um, as shown here in these examples, uh, in this example, and, and quantified here. And we, we linked this to uh, PI3K activity and downstream to PI3K, AKT, and VEGF secretion. So we know that this is all lymphoma cells. The lymphoma cells from mice that lack PD4B, they secrete less, they make and secrete less VEGF in association with suppression of PI3K. However, uh, because we are always interested in, in doing something that can be translated, you cannot knock out PD4B in people, so we did a mouse model of a, a random trial. So these are isogenic lymphomas. So you take lymphomas from one donor and you inject in, in 20 mice, let's say. And all of these mice are going to develop the same lymphoma and you treat half of them with uh, vehicle and half with roflumilase. This is the same drug that we gave in the clinic to the patients. And uh, then you wait for the lymphomas to develop. Uh, honestly, some lymphomas didn't develop here, but when they develop and you uh, collect and measure the vessels, always roflumilase decrease vessel uh, microvessel density, uh, as shown here in, in these three different donors. So we had different donors to make sure that there was no genetic heterogeneity accounting for the results. And it's always and interesting here in association with a decrease in VEGF levels in the serum uh, and also in the urine that I didn't show here. So we, we came away from this work. I'm sorry, there's one more point that I want to make is that if you go to humans, and these are biopsies uh, from patients, so remember we're linking phosphodesterase 4 to angiogenesis, so we have uh, quantified phosphodesterase 4 in human DLBCL biopsies and microvessel density, and there is a correlation, meaning that PD4 levels and cyclic MP activity is probably one of the factors that account for angiogenesis in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So uh, when we put this together, uh, we, we came away with the notion that really phosphodesterase 4 inhibitors have really pleiotropic effects in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. They act on the lymphoma cell, very likely uh, downstream from the B cell receptor. So these are the candidate uh, tumors to to expose to roflumilase, and they act also uh, in the microenvironment. And here is not simply because of VEGF uh, secretion, that's the data I showed you, but we have evidence now doing different transplant models that it actually acts also in, in, the, in, the, in the vessel, uh, outside, the, independent of VEGF secretion. So uh, for this reason, we opened the second trial. That's the trial I always wanted to, to, to open. Uh, so. Uh, we are giving roflumilast uh, together with our CHOP to treatment naive DLBCL. It's again a phase one. This is a phase one B that hopefully will go without a glitch for the next uh, perhaps one, 12 months. Uh, and then, I re then we can really answer the question that we have been hovering around for about now 15 years. Is this uh, drug good for this disease? And uh, we intend to do a randomize uh, our CHOP versus our CHOP roflumilase, and I think we have all the rationale to do it. Uh, enrollment here on this trial that is single institutional, it just opened, we enrolled the first patient, and uh, it did really well, uh, is that the FDA was annoying, and they wanted, uh, so they didn't want the trial. So eventually we told them, okay, we're doing non-GCB only, which is the most aggressive diffuse large B-cell lymphomas, and they allowed us to do, but our population is shrunk a little, uh, we are hopeful that in, with five patients, no toxicity, and the toxicity really that we are concerned are uh, twofold infections because this is an anti-inflammatory drug and can suppress uh, innate and adaptive immune response and also angiogenesis. Uh, but I don't think it gets to the level of a vaccine at all. But uh, so these are the toxicities that we are concerned in about five patients. I think we can expand to non-GCB and GCB and then conclude the phase one and then go to the phase two. So, um, for the second part, I, I think it's, uh, to us, it's really clear that PD4 inhibition suppresses lymphoma cell uh, and its microenvironment. We have shown this for several years now. Uh, Roflumilast is the PD4 inhibitor approved for COPD. It's safe, uh, has a degree of efficacy in patients with refract 
refractory and relapsed material B-cell tumors. And uh, we are really hopeful that uh, the combination of our chop could improve the cure rate of the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. If we get to the point where you know, rituximab came, came into play with 10% improved survival, I'll be more than happy. Uh, very good, so this is us. Uh, in red are people in my lab that work on um, the metabolomics uh, side, the metabolic uh, vulnerability. Uh, in green, uh, those in phosphodiesterase 4. In yellow, which is the combination of green and, and, uh, <laughs> and red, is my uh, MVP, uh, Lin. He does uh, pretty much everything always exceptionally well. Sometimes his triplicates are so good that I, I say, no, don't do it so well because people will think that we are making this up. So just, just mess up one of them because the, the error bars are just so small. It's just ridiculous. These are my collaborators. Uh, UT Southwestern, uh, Raf and Dinesh have been instrumental to quantify some of these metabolites. We get samples from Europe uh, still uh, to do um, uh, many of our studies. And these are the people that paid for it. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so what I know about PD4 uh, activity in uh, pre B cell receptor signaling? In, in. Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't do enough of these experiments, so that's the caveat. Uh, we, uh, however, uh, the first time that phosphodiesterase 4 was suggested to play a role in. Uh, uh, B lymphoid cancers was actually in ALL. This is a paper in 1973 in Nature, uh, and it was not followed up, uh, and then obviously, and then uh, more recently, about 10 years ago, there was another report uh, suggesting that uh, ALLs, uh, B ALLs, would be uh, susceptible to inhibition if you modulate uh, phosphodiesterase four levels. Uh, I don't know if so no, these studies looked at downstream uh, mediators, like P53 was suppressed, but it was actually totally distal to the effect. So it was not through P53. So I don't know if the signaling, uh, the pre-BCR, or whatever signal is intact already in BALLs, would be uh, countered by cyclic MP. As you probably know, uh, actually, Marcus Munchin has this idea that it's actually the contrary, that the B cell receptor signal, and maybe he's right in, in ALLs, uh, in BALLs, that actually it's good to have high B cell receptor signaling because you, you sort out the cells. You, you, that, there is a fresh show that the cells will die. So I'm just trying to uh, sort of take my knowledge from the mature B cells to the pre B cells, and it would not work because if if it decreases signal and decreasing signal is bad, then bad. But there are all of these little reports with cell lines, I think some xenograph models suggest that it may work. So uh, that's a long answer to uh, what I know. So I, 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 I never go to BALL. I, I like material B cell tumors. <laughs> right, yes. So it, it's very interesting, the, the selectivity of mTOR inhibition in the diffuse large B cell lymphoma uh, when you uh, give alpha q Presumably because there's no growth inhibition in normal cells, they don't have the same relationship between alpha q glutarate and mTOR. Would that be true? Uh, what's different about the well, no, no. So I think that the, so I, I didn't work extensively in mTOR signaling and normal B cells. But we have one, and I, I know the N is of one, but we see the same decrease in TOR signaling that we see in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. I just think that the cells do not depend on TOR to survive. They, so normal cells, if you turn off, I think TOR is turned out off all the time, right? So if you are starving, uh, TOR is off, and we are not dying all the time. So I think uh, the cell becomes quiescent. Probably what is happening, and I, I really need to emphasize that I think TOR plays a role, but I didn't do the genetic models that matter yet. So I, may, I have to make a raptor that is mutant to AMPK to show that maybe TOR looks great, but it's not the reason why the cells are dying. I suppose there is a reason to think that they are dying, at least in part, by 
TOR because TOR is, uh, the cells tend to rely on it, cancer cells. So I think that both are inhibited. Uh, the cancer cells rely the most, but it is true that my data so far could be a correlation, could be a, as Seinfeld would say, a big coincidence, right? So it's, a, it's just that TOR always is suppressed and the cells all die. I have to give it to you, though, however, that there is not a strict correlation between the amount of TOR that I suppress and how much a cell dies. So I have worked with a panel of up to 20 different diffuse large B cell lymphoma cell lines, which are all uh, of different genetic background, uh, and uh, some of them uh, suppress more efficiently and it's not commensurate with the degree of TOR suppression. But again, it's a Western blot, you know, so how much can you quantify that? So I, I, I think TOR plays a role. I don't want at all to give you the impression that it's the only player here. Yes. Alpha ketoglutarate that you give to the cells is quite significant. I saw some graphs going close to the hemoglobin. Yeah. So, are you, is it possible you're soaking up all the coenzyme A because the next step is PCA? Do you succeed in creating a data picture? Okay. Yeah. So, I think this is critically important, and uh, I would very much like to. Uh, do a more broad measurement of metabolites in the TCA cycle and otherwise uh, once I expose the cells to alpha glutarate level. I can say that the amount of alpha glutarate that we get, yes, is in millimolar amounts, but this is poorly cell permeable. So when I measure alpha glutarate inside the cell after exposing them to this amount, it's not dramatically different from a cell that has alpha glutarate high because I have glutaminase. Uh, occurring. So I'm not creating something that is so artificial that it's simply I'm collapsing the TCA cycle. I think that we are, so the amounts that we use are also not dissimilar from those in the C. elegans study. That is an organism and they, they don't die. Uh, so, but you, you bind to complex five and inhibit. Uh, I didn't do, however, uh, I didn't measure a large number of metabolites, so did a flux analysis upon exposing the cells to alpha KG to know what is happening happening in the TCA cycle or, or, or beyond. Uh, <laughs> what I think is that this is the, almost you can build uh, several stories, all of them being true from alpha ketoglutarate. There is the dioxygenase, and you can take any one of them. There is this fatty acid synthesis inhibition, which I think plays a, a significant role, and there is our view on on TOR that I think also plays a role. Uh, how much in interconnected they are, we don't know. But it is necessary to, to, to measure more metabolites, to, at least to publish it, uh, you know. <laughs> That's always the goal. Yes, yeah. Uh, a related question. Well, do you anticipate the consequences of contaminants and Okay, so... Uh, so in cancer, uh, there's a lot of, uh, because of the reductive carboxylation profile of cancer cells, uh, the, a lot of the alpha KG in the cell comes from glutamine, from glutaminase. Uh, and when you have an excess of alpha KG, what happens often is that the cell, uh, IDH, uh, starts the reverse, uh, making isocitrate, uh, reducing alpha ketoglutarate. So if I soak up the cell uh, with, uh, if that is what is happening with alpha glutarate, I think glutaminase would be to some extent limited. Uh, perhaps there is no need for the cell to uptake more alpha glutarate through glutamine. Uh, I suspect that when I measure the metabolites, what I may see is that IDH now uh, reducing alpha KG uh, towards isocitrate, mostly then moving the TCA cycle forward. Um, one interesting feature that is related to that is that cells that have accumulation of D2 hydroxyglutarate, uh, IDH mutant cells, are particularly sensitive to glutaminase inhibitors. And this is in part because, so you can make a correlation. Uh, when you have excess of D2 hydroxyglutarate, alpha ketoglutarate functions are being uh, uh, limited. And the cell takes in a lot of glutamine. 
So it's almost the reverse of what happens when I add alpha ketoglutarate. So glutaminase is incredibly active in cells that are uh, making a lot of d 2 hydroxyglutarate because most of the d 2 hydroxyglutarate the metabolite, comes from glutamine, not from glucose. And uh, I would expect, without any present proof, that if I add excess of alpha ketoglutarate, glutaminase would be uh, limited. Building primarily on the correlation of the opposite. Yeah. How can you experiment Okay, so uh, I have I have a perhaps not orthodox view on IDH mutation. So the the IDH mutant uh, so the, the IDH is very very interesting because. Uh, so we show that the levels that we get in a, in a B cell, uh, the cell doesn't survive. So it requires a very specific context for IDH mutation with the massive amounts of d 2 hydroxyglutarate to survive, right? Uh, I think that this is the mutation that, although that, is, that AML is a cancer, uh, I don't think you should ever try to inhibit IDH on those cells because I think that is a vulnerab vulnerability to the cell. Uh, so the accumulation of, uh, of d 2 hydroxyglutarate uh, uh, by impairing a bunch of enzymes, uh, for example, this is mostly from glioma literature, will make the cell particularly sensitive to uh, classical chemotherapy because one of the enzymes that repair DNA is an alpha-KG dependent dioxygenase. So cells with high levels of d 2 hydroxyglutarate cannot repair DNA efficiently. All right, so this is well established uh, in, in the literature. Uh, but this is a bringing from the glioma literature. In AML, and we dis I discussed with Dan this morning, I think uh, one of the features of cells that accumulate d 2 hydroxyglutarate they have a very limited ability to buffer ROS. So these cells are incredibly vulnerable uh, to small modifications of uh, oxidative stress. And this is for two reasons. One is that d 2 hydroxyglutarate alone inhibits... Uh, glutathione and SOD activity. And to generate uh, d 2 hydroxyglutarate you consume a lot of NADDPH. So the buffering ability of this cell is very, very poor. So I think that the IDH mutant cells, uh, the AMLs, uh, I don't know, you said that they do better. I don't think, is this, I don't think it's well established that they always do better than uh, another AML. Maybe, well, maybe it is, but I think to the point, I think that uh, this is an AML that uh, actually it makes easier for the doctor to treat if you do not remove the D2 hydroxyglutarate. I think the D2 hydroxyglutarate he is in the, on the brink to be toxic to the cell, and that is what this paper in cell that I showed you found. That most of the AMLs, if you expose them to the amount of D2 hydroxyglutarate that a IDH mutant cell has, will die. So I think it's, a, it's really a Goldilocks thing here. So you have to have the right context with the right amount. And I think in part is why IDH is not that, it's frequent, but not that frequent. But I think it's, uh, this is a cancer mutation that creates a vulnerability. And that's why the gliomas that are IDH mutant are actually of better outcome. These are not uh, GBMs, right? So they are the low-grade gliomas, 80% IDH mutant. So I think it's, Here's a cancer mutation that I think you should keep. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so two questions. One, do you recommend your patients stop off at the muscle building store and the supplement store on the way home uh, from their appointment? Did you ever? <laughs> well, no, I don't think they should. Not yet. <laughs> they might throw off the statistics. Yeah, like well, that. yeah. Um, uh, so when you... Lymphocytes are interesting when it comes to their metabolism. When you when you push them one way or the other in terms of glycolysis versus the TCA cycle, they they, they favor different differentiated states, right? So, so lymphocytes are very differentiated in accumulating biomass, they tend to be glycolytic. If they're memory and more class, they tend to be. So in these trials, do you have the opportunity to take a look at the rest of the lymphocyte pool and ask the question, are you, are you pushing the T cell pool, particularly in my view, but, but in other, I guess if you're getting rid of the B cells? In this alpha glutarate set, you're targeting. Okay, so the alpha glutarate. You're having a broader impact on the capacity of the rest of the immune system to help respond. To 
It could be, but I have to make the, the, the clarification that all the data that we have in alpha ketoglutarate rate is either uh, in vitro or ex vivo primary samples or in mouse, but mouse that are immunosuppressed because this is a xenograph. So we never looked at the uh, T cell repertoire, for example. I think that as almost, now the, the, actually the question is very pertinent for the cyclic MP, which we are giving to people, and uh, phosphodesterase 4 is also the primary phosphodesterase of T cells. And uh, fortunately, to get up FDA approved, they treated uh, 10,000 patients uh, with COPD, and there is a massive amount of data from these trials, and there is no uh, significant dysfunction of the T cell uh, activity in these patients. So I think it gets to that point where the cancer cell is probably more uh, sensitive. To me, it was always like imatinib. Right, so ABO is a, almost like a housekeeping. It's everywhere, and you still inhibit uh, ABO, and just the CML cells will die. So I think there is this uh, particular sensitivity of, lymph of cancer cells to a given uh, compound and pathway, and therefore you can get away with it. But I, I fully recognize that both alpha-KG and cyclic MP will change the immune response. Ricardo, I think we have to finish now, but that was a uh, bench-to-bedside tour. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you.